Hi everyone, this is Dr. V. I am back with another video talking about eukaryotic transcription essentials. Um, I did a previous video on prokaryotic transcription, so if you want to go ahead, I would actually recommend you watching that video first and then watch this. But anyway, we'll still talk about some essentials because there's, there's some differences between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription. Okay, so this picture actually is depicting what is going on with transcriptions in eukaryote. As you can see here, it takes place in the nucleus, because here's the nucleus and here's the nuclear envelope, which is where you would find the messenger RNA leaving. So, you know, making a copy of DNA is called replication, but that's not what I'm going to talk about in this video. What I'm talking about is actually making a copy of genes in the form of messenger RNA. And that process is transcription. Now, after the messenger RNA is made, like right after the transcriptional process, it's not the full matured messenger RNA. It's known as pre-mRNA. That's one difference that we do not see with the prokaryotic. The prokaryotic RNA is not a, in the preform. It's actually as it's made, it can be used. Now, after the pre-mRNA is made, it has to get processed before it can become the mature mRNA by modifications and splicing, which I'll talk about. And then it will leave to go and go through translation, which is making a copy or translating the message into proteins. So we'll talk about this process um, leading up to here, but we will have translation in another video. Okay. okay, so just like the prokaryotic organisms actually need a promoter region, that special region found in the DNA for RNA polymerase to bind, eukaryotes need something very, very similar. Eukaryotic DNA also holds a promoter region, and the promoter region serves the same purpose as we do see in the prokaryotes, which includes RNA polymerase binding, its orientation, and its enhanced property for transcription to occur. So if we take a look just really quickly on this side, we see that there are um, a Tata box that is present, we see here, and upstream to that is an enhancer region, and this collectively will help the RNA polymerase to actually bind, orient, and to enhance the transcriptional process. Now, the, trans the actual open reading frame starts around here, and what we see are sequence of exons and introns. So this is the actual portion that would get transcribed into a message. But this portion up here is upstream to that. Something very similar to what we saw with the prokaryotes. Now to look a little bit deeper here, this is showing you once again the Tata box and the promoter. And here is the region where you'll find a transcriptional factor 2B, which I'll talk about later, that will recognize. And that's actually essential for RNA polymerase. Another thing I want you to note here is that you remember the promoter region in the prokaryotes uh, were minus 35 and minus 10. That's, you know, how far it is away from the transcriptional start. But here it's about minus 30 to minus 25, minus 31 to about minus 26 that we see here. So the location of the promoter is a little bit different. Um, but it doesn't matter, it still serves a similar purpose. And we see here, this will be where initiation or transcriptional start will actually occur at that region at plus one. So this is just showing you the eukaryotic promoter region. Okay, so let's start talking about the initiation of transcription. Before I actually do that, I do need to talk about the primary RNA polymerase that we see with eukaryotic transcription. This is different than what we see in the prokaryote. The eukaryotic RNA polymerase is RNA polymerase 2. That is the main one that we see. So here you see the DNA that is serving as the template, it's very similar to what we saw with um, for prokaryotes. And here we see the polymerase kind of associating with the DNA, and we have our RNA transcript being made. Okay, so let's talk about now the transcription initiation. 
If you looked at the video with the prokaryotes, you saw that the prokaryotes, when they initiated, it needed a factor called a sigma factor. There is no sigma factor when we're talking about eukaryotic transcription. When we're talking about eukaryotic transcription, you must think transcriptional factors abbreviated as TFs. Okay, So just to show you right here, this is how it starts out. So we have our promoter region that I just described on the previous slide. Here's the transcriptional start and here's the Tata box that we see here. All right, so the first thing we have to remember is that the transcriptional factor 2D is the one that will recognize the Tata box. And there's a protein that's associated with it called TBP that we see right here, okay? All right, so I'm going to try to draw out for you um, what's actually going on here. So here we have our DNA sequence, okay? So... Here, I'm trying to draw it here, and it has that little um, TA box here, Tata box, okay? Now, at the Tata box, what we have is transcriptional factor 2D that will sit on there. So here is our transcriptional factor 2D, transcriptional factor 2D. At this site, you're going to have a recruitment of other transcriptional factors, so if we take a look here, the next thing that will happen, so here we have, I should use multicolors. Here's transcriptional factor 2D right here. I'm going to try to color code it. And then it will recruit transcriptional factor 2B. Okay, and then we have 2A over here. Okay, transcriptional factor 2B. Okay, so that's important. So you have that recruitment. Once it is there, you can start recruiting the other transcriptional factors. We have transcriptional factors E. We have transcriptional factors F that will come. But I want to take note of one of the most important ones, which is transcriptional factor 2H. Okay, so I want you to see that RNA polymerase is here at this point now. The transcriptional factor 2H actually serves an important role because the H works like a helicase, okay? So that's a good way to remember it. And what a helicase will do, so if you see your DNA right here, it will actually allow it to kind of bubble open and form that open complex, so kind of open it up to start that transcriptional process. Because here you see your RNA polymerase, which is there. It came along with the 2F. And the transcriptional factor 2H will kind of open it up. So this whole complex that we see here is the initiation complex. So remember, 2D was the first one to come and sit on the Tata box, and then it recruited 2B. And then after that, it started recruiting the others, 2F, H, E, and A. They're all very important, but that H kind of serves as a helicase, right? So this is how it initiates. This is a lot different than what we saw with the prokaryotes. So remember, transcriptional factors are really important at initiating the transcriptional process. And remember, this occurs at the promoter region. Okay, so just like how we saw with the prokaryotes, you remember there was initiation, elongation, and termination. So if you have your DNA here, and you have your RNA polymerase that is here, so RNAP, okay, RNAP2, and it's already started the initiation pro process, and here is the little messenger RNA transcript that's being made, so mRNA, well, it's actually PRE, pre-messenger RNA at this point. All right, so what's going to happen is that the RNA polymerase is going to continue to slide down. Okay, as it slides down, it will continue till it gets close to the end here. So here, once again, we have our RNA polymerase. Here is our long messenger RNA transcript. So as it continues to slide, it continues to make the pre-mRNA, which we see here. Now, termination now is 
Another thing, and there's a lot of research that's still being done, is still not as quite known as we see with the prokaryotes what goes on, but there are some things that we are that is out there that we do know. Okay, so here we have, you know, you have your messenger RNA, right, being made. So I'm just going to try to draw it down here. Remember, we had our RNA polymerase that was there, okay? And so let's say that, you know, this is where you had your, let me do a different color, your coding sequence, which was here. You know, let's say this was where you had your transcriptional start site. Okay, so up here we do have that leading sequence up at this point. That's the five prime end. Here we have our three prime end. There's, and let's say here is where we have our stop region, okay? So I'm gonna kind of shade this in a little bit. All right, so let me just do it like this. Okay, so if that's the stop, there's usually what's known as a termination signal that's found a little bit downstream to the stop sequence that we saw. Okay, so this little termination signal is actually found in what we call the trailer region. And it consists of A's that we see here, so a lot of A's, okay? We do have a U in there. All right, but there's a lot of A's in this region, and this is a poly-A signaling region that will terminate the process, okay? And shortly right after there, there is a cleavage site that will come and get cleaved, and then the messenger RNA can leave, okay? So just to clarify what has occurred here, because it looks like a lot of mumbo-jumbo, I'm just going to simplify it for you without the RNA polymerase. So here is the messenger RNA transcript that was made. You know, here is, let's say, here is where the gene stopped, right? Here is where it started, and here is that little leader part. Now, downstream to where the stop is, the stop codon, okay, there's a little trailer, right? And the trailer um, contains the termination signals, which are a bunch of A's, and you do have a U in there, okay? And after that point, um, you'll have cleavage of the RNA. Remember, this is the five prime end, that is the three prime end. All right, so this is how it terminates. There is a trailer region that has a termination signal and then it gets cleaved okay all right this is uh, a little bit different than what we saw in the prokaryotes because we had a you know in prokaryotes we have the row dependent and independent factors of termination here we do not have row factors there are sequences that will signal termination okay so the question is what happens to the messenger rna because at this point it really is not uh, ready to go out and become translated. What we have is the pre-messenger RNA. All right, so there's something that happens to the pre-mRNA pre as it's being made. So let's go ahead and take a look what happens. On the five prime end, so here is the five prime end, the three prime end will be somewhere down here. It's a five prime end. As the messenger RNA is being transcribed, here's a five prime end, it has to get capped on that five prime end. And it gets capped with something called seven methyl guanosine. So it's like almost like a methyl cap present, okay? So seven methyl guanosine is found on the five prime end of the growing pre mRNA. Now, this is really important to have this here because. Inside um, of the cell, um, there are exonucleases called five prime exonucleases, and they will chew up five prime ends that aren't capped. So this is important to ensure that the messenger RNA is okay. So the first thing that we see is that the five prime end gets capped with the seven methyl guanosine. Okay. Now something else happens to the three prime end after it's been cleaved. So you remember we had all those A's at the um, around the termination site sequences, and after it gets cleaved, you don't want the end just open, right? So we actually have to add a poly A tail. 
so it gets polyadenylated. So as you can see here, it's a lot of adenines that are present. It's very important for these adenines to be placed there because they help in the regulatory process um, and it also helps to stabilize the messenger RNA. So we see that we have our messenger RNA, pre-mRNA at this point, that is capped on the seven on the five prime end with seven methyl guanosine, and we have a poly A tail on the three prime end. So that's the modifications that occur. But messenger RNA is still not ready to go out. It's still in the pre-mRNA form. And it's actually in a form called heteronuclear, um, heterogeneous nuclear mRNA or HNR mRNA. Let's talk a little bit more about this messenger RNA because at this point, it's still pre-messenger RNA. Okay, so this RNA is actually not ready, even though it may be capped and polyadenylated. It contains something called introns. Okay, introns are not coding. They do not code for anything. They are found as spacers in the actual gene itself. The coding regions are the exons, okay? So this is actually not good to take this and go into translation because if you try to translate the message, then you'll end up with non-coding sequences and then you will not have a good protein that is usable. So we have to go through a process called splicing, right? So these introns that you see here has to get removed and those exons have to be put together. All right, so, so far now we have our exons and introns. So let's see what actually happens here. Okay, so let's take a look at how we get these introns out. All right, so this is just showing you the basics that I just said before, that you have exons and introns that are present. Um, the introns don't code for anything, so they have to get spliced out. Okay, so to, in order for splicing to occur, we need the spliceosome um, complex to form. So splice. So, so, okay, it's a series of proteins that will come along and they will actually recognize, recognize certain consensus sequences that are found between the introns and the exons. That's how it can actually um, know what is an intron and what is not. So they will kind of come together um, and form a lariat. So let me just show you what it looks like. So let's say that's an exon and that's another exon. So I'm going to put E for that. And I'm going to put a red here for an intron. Okay. So the spliceosome complex, you have a series of proteins that will come and kind of sit on this region because it's going to recognize those sequences between the introns and exons. All right. So when that happens, what we're going to see is, and I'm going to erase this so you can see a little bit better what's going to happen. I'm going to bring the exons a little bit closer. We will have the intron kind of looping, right? That lariat formation, because we have our enzymes that will be spliceosome enzymes that will be here. And what it will do is excise and cut out the actual intron. And then after it cuts out the intron, then it will seal up the exons together. So that's called splicing. So there's a spliceosome complex that actually comes, takes out the introns and seals together the exons so you can have your messenger RNA that we see right here. Okay, so the question I have is why splicing why do we even have these introns i don't understand what in the world introns are for and how they serve a purpose well they actually do serve a purpose so even though they do not code for anything essential they actually play a regulatory role and as well when we have different isoforms of protein you can have what's known as alternative splicing all right, so if you saw the prokaryotic video, I mentioned that the messenger RNA in the prokaryotic organisms are polycystronic. Polycystronic meaning that you can have one promoter and then you have a transcriptional unit, but the transcriptional unit can have multiple coding genes within the same unit. That is not the same for the 
um, the messenger RNA that we see in the eukaryote. So if you take a look here, there's only one open reading frame per transcript, very different to what we saw with the prokaryote. There is still that promoter region. There is a region called untranslated region that's found both at the beginning and the end. But note, there's only one open reading frame that is present. So that's what it's mean to be monocystronic. Okay, so it's quiz time. Let's see what you retained. All right, first question. What bases are typically found in the eukaryotic promoter region? Now, it's very similar to what we saw with the prokaryotic. So if you said thymine and adenines, you're correct. Because you remember, that's the Tata boxes that we see in the promoter region. What is needed to initiate transcription in eukaryotes? All right, so remember when we spoke about prokaryotes, they actually need sigma factor, but sigma factor is not found in the eukaryotes. What we actually have are transcriptional factors. Transcriptional factors are essential at starting off the process. All right, so with that said, which transcriptional factor or transcription factor binds the Tata box first? So remember the Tata box is in the promoter region, which is upstream to the transcriptional start. There is one transcriptional factor in the eukaryote that we find is there first, because you remember the promoter region is what will actually allow the polymerase to come along and bind but it needs the transcriptional factors there first. And just as a reminder, the transcriptional factor 2D, the reason why we see 2 is because it's working with RNA, polymer, RNA polymerase 2. All right, what is placed on the 5 prime end of the pre-mRNA and why is it important? So remember, as messenger RNA is being made, there is a cap that is placed on the 5 prime end. So that cap is 7-methylguanosine. It's really important. That methyl group on the guanine that's placed on the end is important because it will kind of act as an armor and prevent degradation of the RNA by any 5' prime exonucleases that may be present. We don't want the 5' prime end to get degraded, so it is capped. What is placed on the 3' prime end of the pre-messenger RNA? So remember, that's on the opposite side now. Remember, as termination was occurring, there were a string of A's found in that termination sequence area, and then there is a cleavage that occurs. After the cleavage occurs, there are a string of things that are added onto the end. So if you said poly A tail, you're correct. There's a string of adenines that's added, and their role is it plays a role in stabilizing and in regulating the messenger RNA. So what occurs during splicing? Remember we spoke about splicing? All right, so splicing is when you are actually using a series of proteins that forms what's known as the spliceosome complex that will recognize the sequences between the exons and the introns. And what it will do is cleave out or cut out the introns and seal the coding sequences together. And remember, those coding sequences are the exons. All right, so hopefully you did well on the quiz. Hopefully you retained the information. I try to compare and contrast the prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Hopefully you saw the prokaryotic video. If you didn't, go back and watch it. And if you did not get 100% on this quiz, just go back and review the video again from the start. I would love to hear what you learned. Please post down in the comment box what you learned or just let me know how you did on the quiz. So until next time, bye.